One of the things I can quite often forget, which I used to be more acutely aware of, is, is um, I've had a very unusual life and I'm extremely lucky to basically be an observer of things when other people are in the middle of them, outside the room, not inside the room. Mm. That's been given to me as a, a gift, and I sound, that sounds really blah, but I don't mean it like that, because when I was a kid, uh, the, 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 the way I saw, the way I dealt, the way I processed things that happened to me was, was through work, through, through music, um, through writing and whatever. That was the, the way I, I, I could see. I see it with my kids, they're both like that too. I'm so happy in a way, thank you, that um, that is still able to happen because uh, it means uh, I'm still alive. Your recollection of the first time you met Tom York? Um, we were in a school play together. He was doing the music, and it was a, it was his production of uh, of Midsummer Night's Dream. I was one of the main actors in it, and I always remember him <laughs> shouting at the teacher. <laughs> How dare he? Yeah, exactly. Subordinate youth. I was always the nutter, and that I seem to have infected them all. I went on this weird recruitment drive in, <laughs> in my own head, yeah, because I'd heard that Colin joined this band that I'd sort of left, um, and I felt really sorry for him because he was playing bass, but they only had a really short lead. So it was, you know... Tethered to the, to the <laughs> Yeah. So I put him down on the list, and I knew his brother was like this big genius, but but younger. And um, I'd heard there was this really great drummer, a bit older. I was trying to find who it was. And then Ed was just walking around looking like he was in the Smith, so obviously he was going to join. Standard. <laughs> what were your first impressions of them all? I don't really remember. I just, I just remember that it was like we didn't really need to say much. We just sort of got on with it. Why did it work early on, do you think? Um, it worked because uh, we supported each other a lot in a kind of a really interesting way. I was wondering uh, when you guys formed your band and um, when did you like make your breakthrough? Yeah, we, we actually formed a band at school way, way, way back in the 80s and uh, a long time ago. And we um, we all went off to college, um, except for Johnny, because uh, he's very young. And uh, <laughs> he's the baby, so he's he's the babe. And we basically we used to come back each holiday and like the only people we knew or were friends with were with each other. And it was really only like a year, two years ago that we started taking it really seriously. 
Uh, were you aiming to get popular and everything? Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, we had to want to want to be successful or be popular. Otherwise, we wouldn't have like, carried on wanting to do it for like seven years. Yeah. You know, whilst we were at school. It has to be obsessive. Last one, this is a song called Papa's Dead. Thank you very much. Oh no, Papa's dead, long live Paul. It died an ugly death by back catalog. And now you know it gets you nowhere. And now you know you realize. Oh no, Papa's dead, it just gave up. We raised the dead, but they won't stand up. Why did you sign to EMI? Well, we thought it was, uh, you know. But I don't see why you should make any pretense to like want to do well and, and work with good people. And uh, like half the people who say this, they've signed to independent are like t t bullshitting, and they know it, you know. Mm. And I don't want to fool anyone. So you have a good record company behind you guys. And yeah. you know how good Frank they are? Sinatra. We're going to give a whole pile of your CDs away. Wow. They're giving them away, aren't they? I mean, I'm, well, I'm sure we don't get any money for them. Yeah, I'm sure away, we haven't sold all these records. I'm, I'm, sure I'm going to talk to my manager about this. Papa's dead, long live One final line of coke for Whitney Houston. What a lovely kill. feel when you expose yourself like this so the songs are so personal and people I don't I don't know if people are really listening to the words but to the I think to the I title. Think, I think they do. Um uh it to play that song live um is really really exhilarating because every time um it sounds a bit that's right but every time um I sing it I still get um, this amazing sensation that so I remember how I felt when I wrote the song, and I'm, and then I'm, I'm singing it to people, and they're sort of picking up on it. When you were here before, couldn't look you in the eye. You're just like an angel. Your skin makes me cry. You float like a fairy. World. I wish I was special You're so very special But I'm a creep I'm not around Yes, 
so fucking special How I wish I was special But I'm a uh, Signed about a year and a half ago and been playing um, I think we've done about 200 gigs now um, since then. Um, got an album out called Pablo Honey, um, which which is doing quite well around the world, especially in America, and quite well in Britain actually. Um, get good pe good press and bad press. Well, we've got um, a couple of weeks off um, to do some more writing for the next album, which we're sort of writing at the moment, and then we're going to America for a week, New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles. And then coming back and then uh, another British tour, then another American tour and then a European tour. Time you said that you were not totally happy with uh, Pablo Honey, why is that? Well, I think, you know, first albums tend to um, be full of uh, uh, a desperate urgency to get everything into every song all the time. And you're not very fussy about how many tracks you fill up. And there, there, was, there was a lot of that. And I think, you know, as a band, we were very young when we did it. So obviously, the, you make mistakes inevitably because of that. Are you scared that you are going to be performing Creep for the rest of your life? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is so exciting something to play now, and I can't see us getting bored of it, really. Radiohead are back with a new album called The Bends and also a double A sided single. Here to tell us more on the beat tonight are Tom and Johnny from the band. Let's talk about Pablo Honey, uh. first of all. <laughs> Over a million copies sold. Did you ever, in your, uh, you know, widest sort of stretches of imagination, think that it would do so well? No, not really. We didn't envisage it selling outside England, really, or Oxfordshire, really. Uh, we'd, we, and certainly never thought we'd leave the country promoting it or that it would last longer than a few months. We already had plans to record the second album, um, and we've been delayed like three years. It was kind of the first thing we ever did as a band, sort of properly, was, was do that album. You know, we hadn't really done any gigs, we hadn't really, we hadn't done anything. We just went in, did an album, just went, oh, okay. Recording an album is like writing something that you're really proud of, but, you know, you can tear it for too long. You can only find so much sort of mileage in it. And uh, we covered a lot of miles, didn't we, really? There was a certain, certain sweet revenge, though. I think when we came back. In what way, Tom? I'd, I'd got like a few nasty stroke personal reviews about like me as well, you know, not just about, oh, the band's shite or whatever. Um, you know, this man is ugly, this man is whatever. And it was really personal stuff and it had really got to me because um, I was trying, you know. And then we went stateside and then suddenly, oh, wow, this great big world. I seem to uh, spend most of my life running um, from either being completely super confident to completely super paranoid. I mean, I set myself up, totally. I remember there was um, some Steve Wright thing. Did you ever hear that, the thing when they did a version of Creep? And it was, uh, there was, they changed one of the verses and said, oh, we're just a bunch of melodramatic schoolboys. Yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. So subsequently, how did that affect the recording of the new album? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, we had a lot to write about. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, it also, our confidence was, was um, when we went in to write it, when we went in to rehearse and stuff, it was great, you know, it was the first time we got to play as a band and, and write stuff since, 
since we'd been signed. We were having a really good time playing it, and then we went into the studio. It was like, oh shit, we're in the studios again. And uh, we, again, we got freaked out. You know, it was a long period of of, of our confidence being um, smashed to smithereens, and then and then um, it coming back. And, uh, you know, by the, we we spent like, how long did we spend in the studios? Like three months or something. We did like, and again, touring got in the way as usual. We yeah. did we did a month there, and nearly finished a lot of the album, and then had a tour in Japan and Europe. Which um, actually did us a lot of good. Yeah. Got us out of the studio because we were all starting to get a bit crazy. <sighs> this is all a bit deep, isn't it? Yeah. So how does this album compare for you two then? I mean, have you thought about it in comparison to um, Pablo Honey? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can listen to this one. How about you? Yeah, this album for us is like, um, like I said, when we first started as a band, we spent five years writing um, songs in our bedrooms and recording them on tiny four tracks. And we used to just play those recordings obsessively over and over again to, to ourselves our mates and well. to our mates, and you know, which sounds very egotistical, it probably was. But this is this is the first recording we've done where I feel like that again, and I'm still listening to it and still kind of getting it. Really feels like we just we just did it in our bedroom, which yeah. we didn't. That would have been quicker. It's, it's kind of something you know we we feel that it's it's really come from us. It's the first recording that's really come from us, um, and because of that. I don't really care what people, how people take it, and it's a really nice feeling. It's a really liberating feeling. Mm. The, the single, of course, in 1993, the one that everybody talks about when they hear radio, they associate Radiohead with Creep. Right. And perhaps people saw you as sort of one-hit wonders at the time. Creep was like the blessing and the bane of this band. It was a blessing that we got to tour throughout the world, and that was fantastic. But it was also the bane that, you know, you have a song like that on your first album, and the history of bands having a big hit like that on the first album is that they don't go anywhere, you know. And if it had been on third or fourth, it would have been fine. But the frustrating thing was that we always thought we, we, we knew we had the material. And um, while we were recording it, even last year we were sort of going out on tour and still sort of promoting Pablo Honey in like Mexico and Thailand and stuff like that. And always, it was always creeping. It's like, hang on a sec, we've just, we're, we're in the process of recording 22 new songs that we're like, like really proud of. The striking video to the new single, Fake Plastic Trees, looks like it was made for the American market. It features the tortured lead vocals of Tom York, who is desperate to rid Radiohead of the Creep label and is at pains to point out the band's new album has moved them on. It's really good, actually, because um, everyone, everyone sort of... The phrase, hey, it's a great album, is catching on all around the world, so... Um, this is for the Benz, the yeah, new album? Yeah, the new yeah. one. So, um, things are uh, fairly easy. People seem to be forgetting about that one song that we used to had before and talking about an album, and, yeah, so um, it's nice enough.
Thank you very much. Good night. Enjoy the prodigy. I think uh, I think it, I think as as a band you you it's sort of like a club and you stick together. And, but there is a point where you actually do have to grow up. <laughs> From doing the bends, we did a, quite a lot of growing up. And that's not to say we don't live in limbo, which we do. And I think the band that, that did the first album, first Radiohead album, mm. does feel like you know seven year olds really compared to what we're doing now. I think <clears throat> They're a bunch of idiots <laughs> with creep and soul. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't have a clue what was happening and so everything was just wrong um, when you're on tour it's sort of you do a lot of things are taken care of um, but there are actually reasons for that it affects me um, if say I have to have meetings with people or you know that sort of thing it, it, it I know that by the end of the day my head is so full up with noise that um, you know, so you you um, exist in a necessary vacuum. I, personally, that's the way I see it. And if you can't concentrate when you're on stage, if you can't focus what you're doing, then it's a waste of time.
1977 album OK Computer. That album, and I don't think I'm being overdramatic here, changed the rock world, taking rock music in a more experimental, ambitious, subtle and challenging direction, setting the course for so much music as the millennium approached. And I remember that we were so happy because the Benz seemed to have legs on it. And we, in fact, we did five tours of America alone on the Benz. And so even when we were making OK Computer, We'd started recording it. We went back and did another tour. Wow. We were listening to different music. Like I was listening to Pet Sounds and What's Going On, and there was Bitches Brew. So sonically, we were getting really influenced by a lot of rich, beautiful sounds, if you like. Yeah. So we played all these sheds, and that you know the sheds they're like eighteen thousand. Enormous. Yeah. And we go on the first two shows, and we do. I think we played Creep, and we played songs off the Benz. The only one they responded to was Creep. And so we were like, hang on a sec. It was, it was a monstrosity. It was terrible, but we knew it was a terrible. So we got straight off that tour. Three days later, we were in this house called St. Catherine's in Bath. And we hit the ground running. And the first three days we did Climbing Up the Walls live, Let Down live. And I mean, that thing when you get a, I'm gonna get a bit of a spine tingle now talking about it is that that thing where there was magic.
should have like come with someone who knew where this was. Tower lobby floor. Tower lobby floor. Tower lobby floor. What putting one up? And uh, thanks very much for the award. Thanks. Bye. Hey, okay, can I say, we've got a bit of a radio today? I'm the Okay, well, thank you. Why don't you stand up and sit down? Hello, how are you? I'm right, how are you? Uh, a bit of uh, radio uh, stuff from Radiohead. Yeah. Hi, uh, we're Radiohead and we're in Japan, and uh, we'd like to say thank you very much to the readers who voted us and our album, best album of 1997. I fucked that up. It's fine. That was good. No, it wasn't. I didn't even say the NME. That's okay. That's fine. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Do it again. Okay. Um, thank you very much for voting us Enemy Best Album of 1997. Cool. Hi, this is Radiohead. Thank you very much. Hey, this is Tom of Radiohead. That's... Hey, this is Radiohead. We're on tour in Japan at the moment, so unfortunately we can't be with you in person. Thank you very much, Denmark, for the Grammy of Foreign Album of the Year. Hope to see you on soon. Hope to see you soon on tour. Bye. You do it. Do you want to be friends? Um. Depends what you mean by famous. If you sort of mean Hollywood famous. No, not really. Uh, famous for for doing good bits of stuff. Then yeah, that'd be cool. Famous for going to film openings. No. Famous for being. Quite good at something, yes, maybe. Famous for being a loud mouse, no. It's quite useful sometimes, as they say. But um, uh, it's not not a guiding force, really. It's not something that's basically terrifying I think, for me. sort of stuff you want on your first birthday together, is it? Right? No, no, not really. It's an interesting video, though, because that's Tom York there, and as you can see, look, it's filling up with water. Oh, God. And it actually goes the whole way. You'll probably quite enjoy it because he actually drowns at the end, so that'll probably like that. Uh, it, it's like, I think it's a reconstruction of Houdini's last, um, last stunt. But that's it, it just moves up. And then the song continues, and he gets completely covered in water. I just don't Does he keep, does he keep singing? Well, no, this is what I was wondering. Look, it's, it's getting well, very we, close we, to the mouth there. Can we fast forward it a bit or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's now worried because the water's rising. He's lifting his head up there, isn't he? He is. You know, he's a bit nervy. Hang on. But I can hear him, but I can't see his lips move. No, he's... Oh. It's Roger de Corsi's son. There we go. He's under now. But he stays under there for ages. How he does it, I've no idea. <laughs>
it was uh, at, the, at the end of OK Computer. We finished touring, and um, I was sort of trapped in a series of sort of uh, in my own particular labyrinth, um, and uh, followed by this weird sort of monologue, uh, criticism, everything, everything I did, being sort of propelled into this weird state where people were projecting things onto me in a particular way. I didn't have the right sort of support mechanism to deal with it and uh, so I internalised a lot of it and it sort of uh, kind of shut me down. when you came back from the OK Computer Tour? It was a mess. Really bad mess. For quite a while. Personally. Because, basically, I'd find myself in a place that I didn't want to be. Um, ended up in a place that I didn't want to be and didn't recognise myself. Um, and wasn't really interested in what it is that we were supposed to have done. Um, Uh, didn't really have uh, much to hold on to, really, in any way. Two years writing block, writing stuff, throwing it away. It's like losing someone you love. We did a lot of touring, yeah. We did a lot of touring. Did that burn you out, personally? Oh, yeah. I was, I was finished when um, we did Glastonbury. And then a year and a half later, we were still going. And I kept saying, you know, every other day, I don't want to do this. And we were like, oh, we've got to do this, we have to do this, because that way we'll never have to do it again. And I guess that they were right, you know. How did the relationships between you and the band change during the years? I mean, I, I can't imagine that since everything's happened to you, that things have changed. In what way? They're better, you know? But were there any difficulties in... Yeah. Can you be more specific? No. Why not? Because it's our business. I, I have a problem with people asking that stuff. So. Because um, it's not anyone's business, really. Have you ever uh, had the idea of quitting Radiohead and doing your own stuff on your own? Thanks, Chris. Do, do you have a problem with these questions? Yeah. Why is that? Uh, it's not your business. It's nobody's business but us. I mean, um, it's, it's just... just do you understand why an album like OK Computer... People are, uh, people are very attached, attached to it, I mean. Yeah, I, th I'm, I understand. I, I, you know, I can't... I obviously can't listen to it. But You I, can't? I, well, no, I, I can't. I can't. Why? 
because it sucks. Fucking rock music sucks, man. I hate it. I'm suck. just so fucking bored of it. I hate it. It's a fucking waste of time.
Depends what you mean by famous, if you sort of mean Hollywood famous. No, not really. Uh, famous for, for doing good bits of stuff, then yeah, that'd be cool. Famous for going to film openings, no. Famous for being quite good at something, yes, maybe. Famous for being... signed with EMI, We'd ha we, we had yeah. a sort of dialogue going about how do, what kind of record are we making, how are we going to release it, you know, who are we going to go, where is it applicable, and then in about April of last year, they came and said, listen, we've got this idea, you know, you're making a donation without sounding pompous or irrelevant or irreverent, rather. Or irrelevant. Or irrelevant. And you had no real idea of the consequences at all. You had no idea how it was going to work out because it was a brand new model, if you think about it. People hadn't really done this before, certainly not on your level. We, you know, sitting down and just finished doing the record, um, wanted to put it up and just, yeah, free of all the mechanics, all the drudgery of the whole thing. Having not basically talked to anybody, done any interviews, any explanation, and nothing. And uh, yeah, it was it was one of the most exciting things we've ever done, I think, actually. 
But look at the changes you've made on the journey in just a bunch of albums. It's not like Dylan, you've released 56 albums or something. It's six or seven or eight albums. The yeah. point is that like, after the Benz, you didn't bring out the Benz too. After OK Computer, you didn't bring out OK Computer too. So you, you did the Kid A thing, you did the Amnesiac, which like blew a lot of people out of the water, going, what's all this about? Again, it's like, it's what we were trying to do on this record in Rainbows. Like being the front man at any stage at all of the band? Me? Yeah. Well, Just like it? Like, for the sure show, not. Yeah. I love that little <laughs> attention. Abuse at railway stations, it's brilliant. Really? Yes, it's fantastic. I love it. Are you a difficult person to live with when you're making an album? And are you an okay person I'm, to live with? I'm appalling. I'm, I, I mean, I don't think any of us are. Given the choices, our families would much prefer we never worked again. <laughs> with each other. Absolutely. But does the process ever get easier? Or would that no. be a failure? I think, you know well, what? that's what we need to sort out. Yeah, we oh. need to sort out. I mean, part of the problem the last two and a half years, or the, the album that took two and a half years, it was very difficult. And we did go to some fairly dark places. And we don't really want to go back there. But I think there's a recognition that if you're going to do, it's like anything in life. If you can do something that's really good, it's going to get tough sometimes. We just have to be a little bit more, um, you know, realistic. And, 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 and also not be so hard on ourselves. Shine it's on again, off again, on again Watch me fall like dominoes in pretty patterns Fingers in the blackbird pie Tingling, tingling, tingling It's what you feel, not what you are to What you are to Reasonable and sensible Dead from the neck up Get some stuff, stuff, stuff We thought you had it in you, but nah, nah Nah, for no real reason Squeeze the tubes and empty bottles I take a bow, take a bow, take a bow It's what you feel now, what you are to What you are to the elephant that's in the room Is tumbling, tumbling, tumbling And duplicate and triplicate And plastic bags in duplicate and triplicate Dead from the neck up Get some stuff, stuff, stuff we thought you had it in you, but no, no, no. Exactly where do you get off? Is enough, is enough. I love you, but enough is enough, enough for that stuff. There's no real reason. You got a head for. Gonna melt it to
to Radiohead released this song, Creep, back in 1993. The British band's become one of the most innovative and critically acclaimed modern rock acts of all time. They've pioneered groundbreaking techniques using processed voices and invented sounds, all behind the delicate and powerful voice of frontman Tom York. This track is called Lotus Flower. It's off Radiohead's latest album, The King of Limbs. They released it themselves without the pressures of a major label and with little fanfare back in February of this year. The band did no big concert tour and no interviews. We didn't feel like it. We didn't want to explain it. Yeah. That's guitarist Ed O'Brien and singer Tom York. And yet, the King of Limbs shot to number three on the U.S. charts. Now, Radiohead is coming out of its shell a bit. York and O'Brien sat down to talk with me last week about how they make music. Before they recorded their latest album, O'Brien described coming off a long tour, exhausted and uninspired. That is, until the band and their producer, Nigel Godrich, discovered some interesting computer software. Which enables you to use MP3 files and trigger them on a turntable, like with vinyl, you know, the, mm -hmm. make loops and stuff. Make loops and on stuff. On the fly. Yeah. So we had an initial session of about five weeks, and it was really like the kids in the kindergarten. Because it was we had absolutely no, it, no idea. No idea. And we literally had five weeks, and it was really interesting because you, what it forced you to do was you, you had to simplify what you were doing. You couldn't do loads of ideas. Probably the most important thing is you had to listen to one another. Believe it or not, that's also something that you can, in a band, you can lose that. Mm. You can get so wrapped up in what you're doing, you're not listening to what other people are doing. So Nigel was very keen that we, we, <laughs> we start listening to one another. And <laughs> It kind of helps when you make a record, believe it or not. Yeah, I mean, it was it was an experiment. We, yeah. I don't think we really genuinely thought anything would come out of it. Certainly not on an entire record.
Radiohead were a hit straight away. You connected pretty quickly. Was that something you were expecting, and, and how did it feel when it happened? Um, was it fun? Yeah, it was kind of cool. We were suddenly <laughs> arriving in America for the first time, and stretch limos, bless them, they've all gone now, thank God. And I remember being in the record company, and they'd laid out a hundred records, and we had to sign them. And I was looking at this pen thinking, and I was like, I've never done this. I've never signed a record before. It was mad. So they put us in first class on an aeroplane. I'm like, what? And then it was really kind of out of control, and we were being asked to go on like live television. We, we'd never been on live television. We'd, we'd been in a van driving around doing support gigs. So how did it feel? It felt funny, a bit of a panic. It imbued the sense that we absolutely didn't deserve this. Thus, 10 years of overcompensating for that by never, ever, ever doing anything that wasn't the best that we could possibly do to the point of total obsessiveness. You know, we'd, we expected to be able to build up our ability to do what we needed to do, get better at it, and then one day the doors would open, but unfortunately the doors opened way before we were ready. I mean, I'm not complaining, actually, because basically without that, we never would have been given the chance, never been allowed to spend months in the studio, mm. because that's the way that record companies worked in those days. If you were making the money, they'll let you do what you want. And I mean, that downside, processing it at a pretty young age, you know, 22, 23, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. very sensitive person. How did you cope with it emotionally? Uh, I got angry, because I've been, I've been pretending all program that I'm like this sensitive you know, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm also an extremely angry person and um, I got more control freakery, I became more unbearable, more like it's going to be like this or it's not going to happen. I sort of put my hands on the steering wheel and I white knuckled and I didn't care who got hurt and I didn't care what I said until the end of OK Computer. I just was white knuckled, don't mess with me because this is what's happening. Years later, I, I sat down with the guys and I apologised. I'm sorry, I didn't realise how bad it got. But that was my way of, I dealt with it. And actually, by the time we got to recording OK Computer, we'd had, the doors had opened up and we had just the best time doing that record because we knew that people were interested in us finally for what we actually were and we, the possibilities just seemed completely endless. Suddenly we had all this support and we fought so hard to get it. And I think the problem for me, if I'm honest, is I wasn't enjoying it till later on because I had my hands so stuck on that steering wheel, white knuckling. I didn't want to make a mistake. I was terrified of making a mistake.
Tom, you're, when asked about fatherhood in the past, you once said, having kids made a massive difference to me. And with the tragic death of your ex-wife, Rachel, at just 48, the challenges of parenting are even more acute. What yeah. kind of dad are you? I guess I'm more like their friend. Uh, I can't hope to be their mum. Um, uh, I'm probably a fairly relaxed dad. Well, they would probably argue differently, but but my son is he's um he's eighteen now and he's just off making music. Um, my daughter's a really positive, great person, makes people laugh. I'm just really proud of them both. I mean, it just stuns me that most days I'm just like I can't believe they're anything to do with me. They're just such great people. We talked earlier about your ambition as a, as a young man. What are your ambitions at fifty? Uh, my ambitions at 50, hmm. Well, I would say my ambition is when um, the kid's mum died, it was a very difficult period. And we went through a lot. And it was very hard. She suffered a great deal. Uh, and my ambition is to make sure that we have come out of it all right um, and I hope that's what's happening I'm lucky now because I have a new partner who's come and brought a light into all of it um, which has taken a great deal of strength um, and really if all that's okay I then want to be able to go to my metaphorical potting shed down the end of the garden and carry on tinkering away on my new devices. That's my ambition. And if I'm still able to make some music that expresses all that and is still important to people, if I'm still taking risks and affecting people, then wow, and it's more than I can ask for. That's way more than I need. That's the right thing. One, two, three, four. So 